Good morning. Good of you to join me. I hope your day is going well, your week is going well. Let's begin with a word of prayer. God in heaven, I thank you so much for your great blessing. I pray that you be with the watchers of this video at this time. May you continue to watch over them, give them good health, give them good days. I uh, pray they continue to lean on you for support and guidance. Father, is only you can bro- and provide it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. The famous tenor Luciano Pavarotti, some of you probably familiar with that name, he wrote, he said, when I was a boy, my father was a baker. He introduced me to the wonders of song. He urged me to work very hard to develop my voice, obviously a skilled uh, singer at very young, young age. Arrigo Polo was a professional tenor in my hometown of Medina, Italy. He took me in as his pupil. At the same time, I also enrolled in the teacher's college. On graduating, I asked my father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? Luciano, my father replied, if you try to sit on two chairs, you'll fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. I chose one. It took seven years of study and frustration before I made my first professional appearance. It took another seven years before I reached the Metropolitan Opera. And now I think whether it's laying bricks, writing a book, whatever you choose, we should give ourselves completely to it. Commitment. That's the key. Choose one chair. I think that's true of all of life and particularly in the area of spiritual development or serving the Lord. We have to choose to be wholeheartedly, singly focused on him above all else. His father said, if you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. I think that's absolutely true. If we try to live for the world and God at the same time, we're going to fall between and miss the whole point and possibly miss uh, the blessing of our salvation, not only that, but even heaven. And what a shame that would be. Gary Henry wrote, What we need to do is develop a more single-minded love for God. We need to eliminate any concerns that compete for our allegiance to God and resolve to give him nothing less than our whole hearts. Jesus said it this way, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. This morning, the topic I'm looking at is developing a servant's heart. And it truly is a development. It's a continuing process that we go through in life. We're going to be over in the Gospel of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. And it's one of the parables of Jesus. Luke 10, 25. I'll let you turn there and find that. Or you can look it up on your phone or whatever you're using, tablet. Luke 10, 25. Luke 10, 25, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your uh, strength, and with all your mind. And love the Lord and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you'll live well. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Hey, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place where he saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil on them and oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took, care, took out two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for the extra expense you have." Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus replied, go and do likewise. 
This morning, I'm going to look at three different hearts that we see in this particular story. The very first heart to be examined is the cruel heart. That's the robbers. It says there in Luke 10.30, Luke 10.30, it describes them. It says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell in the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. That's the cruel heart. Now, when we understand that, we understand that they beat the man and left him basically penniless along the way and also there to die. That They didn't really care one way or the other. That is a definitely a cruel heart. If you understand historically, the geog uh, geographically, the setting of this story, it appears that this man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's a 17-mile journey south, but it mentions there, uh, excuse me, north, but it mentions there that the man was going down. The reason why is Jerusalem sits up on a hill. Jer uh, Jericho is down lower in the valley. That 17-mile trek has a, a, a descends of about 3,300 feet over that time, uh, which is not an incredible amount. But you see, this uh, way from Jerusalem to Jericho has been called the way of the blood or the way of blood. There's a reason for that. One, it zigzags down the mountainside. Another is there's boulders to the left and to the right. And it's just a horrible way to travel, especially if uh, as you're traveling to Jericho. And it wasn't uncommon during the day for robbers to hot off on the side of the road. You know, we understand that. That's happened in our own country before. We had stagecoach thefts back in the West, and through centuries that's gone on. But this is no different. These thieves are off to the side. They jump out probably, attack the man, overwhelm him, probably more than one, and take everything that he's got. That's the cruel heart. That's how that responds. You and I really shouldn't be shocked at such actions. There's people in our world today that act the very same way. There's no different. The cruel heart is still around, and there's people that don't care anything about anyone else except for themselves. But one thing we've got to guard against, too, and you and I might say, well, I would never rob somebody. I'd never attack them, leave them half dead by any means. But you and I can have a cruel heart at times, too, as well, if we're not very careful. How we treat other people is incredibly important. The attitude can be played out in daily life. For instance, when we interrupt someone's privacy, or when we bang our car door into somebody else's door, and we look at the car and think, well, that wasn't that bad, or that car isn't worth that much. No need to worry about that. We jump in front of somebody else while waiting in line. We cut them off in traffic. We maybe read someone's private mail or email or something of that nature, a message. So we can have a cruel heart as well when we belittle other people and think they're not of great value. We can have a cruel heart if we're not very careful. It's a heart that takes action upon things that we think are not as important. So we must guard against the cruel heart. The second heart is an uncaring heart. That's what you have out of the priest and the Levite here. We see an uncaring heart of these two, of all people, religious people. Luke 10, 31 and 32. A priest happened, uh, happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he saw the place, saw him pass by on their side. And, and we don't get out of that necessarily either just reading that, but when it says the other side, it gives the impression that they're going to the farthest edge of the road they can without falling off to avoid this individual. They saw him, and yet they avoided him so drastically, so dramatically, that they didn't even want to look on him. They knew he was there, but they didn't care. Now, the priest is part of the upper class. They oftentimes served at the temple. The Levites, necessarily not priests, but they were part of the tribe of Levi. They may have had some ministry as well. It would appear that both of these individuals had some kind of ministry at the temple because they were coming out of Jerusalem. Or maybe they were there to sacrifice. Who knows? But they walk past this man, and they keep their distance, and it's intentional. Now, when Jesus shared this parable that day, I don't know what was in the mind of the hearers, the crowd, Maybe some weren't surprised because they didn't care for priests or Levites. Maybe they felt like they were out for their only good. Matter of fact, the individual that asked this question, he said he was a, uh, a, a lawyer 
He, he was a, 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 per, a person that was very involved with the law, that knew what it taught. Love God, love your neighbor, or take care of your neighbor. He knew that. And he may have been something of that nature as well. But in the crowd's mind, or maybe even the individuals as Jesus told this story, maybe the priest and the Levite realized, you know what? That person over there may be dead. And if I go over there and touch them, I become unclean. I can't continue to serve at the temple. I've got to go through the rites, the rituals to be made clean. And it takes over a week to do that at times. So they didn't really have time because of that. Or, or maybe they just didn't want to be bothered. I don't know. But if that person was dead, they would become uh, ritually unclean. Or maybe the crowd or maybe the individuals thought, well, you know what, my personal safety. There's a fellow laying on the side of the road. Could it be a trap? That would be uncommon. That's happened before. People lure us in expecting help, and then there's somebody else attacks us from behind or from the side. Personal safety. Maybe the crowd thought, well, maybe it's not such a bad thing they avoided this situation. Or even that idea of, these were Jewish people. Levites and priests were Jews. They had to be. And if they touched somebody that was a Gentile, they become unclean as well. Had to go through the ritual cleaning again, through that process of becoming whole again. That would be a reason to avoid. And, and Gentiles, or excuse me, Jews, could not stand to be around Gentiles. Couldn't even go in their home, couldn't touch them, anything of that nature. That's why such a radical departure when the New Testament started, when there were so many Jews in the church, and Gentiles were accepted in. There was this, this difficulty between accepting the two. What other idea is time? Maybe the priest and the Levite didn't want to be bothered with the time. Maybe the crowd thought, you know what? It's going to consume time. They've got places to go. They've got things to do. There's things on their calendar to get accomplished. And if they go and help this fellow, then it's going to eat into that time. And We've all experienced that. You know, if you help somebody, it's going to take your time. And maybe that's why you choose not to do it. Maybe it's not safety. Maybe you just don't have time at that point. But that's not uncommon during the day. They had things to do. They had places to go, people to see. So time was an effort as well. And maybe even the excuses they would have given would have made sense not to help others. But really, we're called to be more than that. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, So in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Jesus said, if you want to be treated well, treat others well. If you expect help when you're in a time of distress and difficulty, you should reach out to others. And Jesus didn't say, um, let me say it in a negative way. But he said, let me say, act in a positive way, and, and positive things will happen in your life. That's the way God wants us to live our lives. Now, we may not see that this, this side of heaven, but we will see it one day. We'll see it lived out. That's exactly what Jesus did. He cared for those around him, and, and good came back. Basically, the concept is good has been done to you. Do good to others. Live in such a way. And Jesus said that fulfills the law and the prophets. That's pretty impressive. Then the last heart that we see, we've seen the cruel heart. We, we've seen the uncaring heart, the servant's heart, which is what we want to develop. It's what we want to be, do and be. The Samaritan came along. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he had pity on him. There's the caring heart. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil, on, oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and I will, when I return, I'll reimburse you for the extra expense. It did take the man's time. It did take the man's effort. It did take the man's money. And here's this Samaritan. And you see, in Jesus' story, as he's speaking to this Jewish crowd, the Samaritan would have been the enemy. He would have been the villain of the story. Surely not a Samaritan is going to do good to anybody. And this man, was all likelihood, that was hurt was probably coming out of Jerusalem to uh, Jericho was probably a Jew, and for a Samaritan to do good to a Jew, that's almost unheard of. It'd be like me sharing a story if I were in Israel today and said, hey, uh, let me tell you the story about this good Palestinian when they're, you know, the friction that's there in the Middle East. Or better yet, let me tell you in a Palestine area, let me tell you about this good Israeli that is helping your people. 
We couldn't possibly imagine that. Or maybe as Americans, we might say, well, there was this American that was down on the side of the road and this Muslim man came along and helped him out. Or maybe even there'll be a racial barrier that's there and we would be amazed that somebody else would help somebody else of a different race that we would consider the enemy. You see, we can't even picture that. But that's exactly what's being portrayed in this particular story. You see, this fellow had a servant's heart and he wanted it displayed. Why would the Samaritan stop? I think because he had a servant's heart. He cared for others around them. So how do you and I develop a servant's heart as we move along? I think the very first thing we, we do daily is be available. That's hard to do sometimes. We do keep busy schedules. Everything's hectic around us. We've got things to do, places to go. But we need to be available. Ask God to send people in our lives that we might be able to assist so that we might develop our servant's heart. The Samaritan didn't plan to help this man, but he did. He was available. And the, ser the second thing is serve intentionally. Don't serve out of obligation. It's easy to do because as a Christian, there's a checklist of things that we need to accomplish. But serve intentionally. Look for opportunities. Minister in ways that you never even possibly thought were imagined, uh, that you could imagine, but God still has called you to minister in that way. Every act of service that we do, every phone call we answer, every card we send, a letter we might write to a loved one that's hurting, or every act of encouragement, the giving of a gift to somebody else will not be forgotten, I promise you. And those little actions build on one another, and we build that servant muscle so that it might increase. Being a servant's been important to me, and sometimes I find it easy and sometimes I don't. When I enter in situations that are new to me or different in different settings, I have a hard time being a servant. Several months ago, I enrolled at uh, St. Mary's Hospital to serve as a chaplain as part of a clinical pastoral education. And I, I really enjoyed the time. I, I enjoy visiting people in the hospital and things of that nature. And I feel comfortable there. But actually uh, doing things for other people while there sometimes, not just spiritually speaking, but physically speaking, is a little bit uncomfortable for me. So I challenged myself by going through this process for about six months and thoroughly enjoyed the experience. I was working an overnight shift uh, one Saturday, and I was uh, called down to the ER. St. Mary's Hospital has a policy there, and it's no one left behind is basically the concept. And then the idea is they never want somebody to pass from this world alone. They want somebody in the room with them. Some, most of the time, it would probably be nursing staff or some kind of medical staff, but oftentimes uh, clergy is called, and that's what I was on call for that day. And they called me down to the ER and said there was a lady that was brought in from a nursing home. Her family had been sitting with her, but she took a turn for the worse, and they brought her to the ER, and no family was there, and they thought she would be passing away very, very soon. They called me just to sit in the room. The nurse that was working with her was had more than one patient, was constantly in and out of the room, taking care of this patient along with several other patients. And so I struck up a conversation. This is a young lady about my daughter's age, and she was an outstanding nurse. When this lady was brought in, her bed was propped up a little too high, no pillow, no really heavy blankets on her, anything of that nature. And this, this beautiful nurse took time. She brushed the woman's hair. She lowered her bed down. She got her a warm blanket out of a warmer. She just made her comfortable. The woman really wasn't cognizant of what was going around around her. She was in that kind of state. But it was kind of amazing to me to watch the transformation of this lady this, that was in the bed, the patient, and how she, what she was taken care of, and this young lady ministered to her needs, spoke kindly to her. Her uh, oxygen level began to increase. She began to breathe easier, and she looked so much more comfortable in that bed. I was so fortunate that day to bless to watch a real servant in action. That's developing a servant's heart. Those things aren't easily learned, but they're things that we can train ourselves to do and be if we would. I pray that you would develop your servant's heart for other people. Watch for opportunities to serve. Be available and serve intentionally because it does make a difference in our world. And that's what Jesus has called us to do. He did it himself. Let's pray as we finish out. And I thank you for 
uh, watching this today. God, pray that you be with those that have watched this. May they serve those around them in a positive light. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. God bless you for watching. Take care of yourself.